I hear this verse, come to me, all of those that are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy. My yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Take and learn. There are, this is what I hear, there are those of you in this service, and this doesn't apply to everybody, that you have yet to come to God in terms of relationship. Not in terms of family, you may be born again, but you have yet to come to God in terms of relationship. It's one thing to be born of your father, it's another thing to know your father. And He is asking you. He is letting you know that the door is open and has been open. And will continue to be open. But why, why would you wait for the burden to be too much? Why do we wait until it's too heavy and then we go and talk to God? Why don't we rather learn from Him right now? Why don't you focus on your relationship with Him and let Him learn and teach you the things that you don't know? There are those of you that have yet to come to Him and He is beckoning and calling to you to come to get to know Him, to have a relationship and a fellowship with Him that is more than just a proclamation more than just an agreement yes I know God and I agree that he is good that, that's not very deep that's not going to cut it when the rubber meets the road and the rubber will and maybe it already has met the road in your life but you have to take a choice make a choice take those decisions and take them seriously and purpose to spend time with him or you're going to be burdened with the same burdens continually. But if you will take what Jesus said, he says, all of you that are burdened and you need rest, come and learn from me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. As much as he calls, as much as he's done, as all the cross and all the pain and the suffering he went to, it would be an awful shame to have all that and not just come and talk to God just a little bit don't you think so he's calling you to have a relationship he's not talking about salvation he's saying you don't know me very well and you know it you know it you're gonna wait until you break and everything's in shambles don't do that don't let the enemy come ravage your life and steal from you and then say, God, where are you? He's, he's here now. Come and learn from Him. Come and learn from Him. Amen. Amen. Praise you, Father. Amen. All right, you can be seated. Kids, you're dismissed. How many of you know fellowship with God is one of the most important things in your life? It really is. Because you can... Uh, hmm. Anybody ever come to the end of their own strength? Yeah. If you haven't, you will. Also, <laughs> the fan, thank you. See, the, the flesh is more than just sin, right? We've been talking about the spirit and the flesh these last couple weeks. 
the Spirit, you've been made alive in Jesus Christ. You have a new nature on the inside of you. Only Jesus could do that for you, right? It's what the law could not do. The law could not, as much as it tried to force you to act good, it couldn't make you good, right? No more than you could force a chicken to behave like a duck. You could write a law that says, here's the duck things you need to follow. You need to know how to swim. You need to know how to fly. Okay, you need to know how to quack. You give that law to chickens and they're going to be like, I understand what you're saying, but I don't know how to do what you're asking. <laughs> right? Well, that's what the law was to the sinner. The sinner, I understand what you're asking, but it's not really in my nature to love my neighbor. <laughs> So what did they do? They had to put in consequence. Well, the only reason you love your neighbor is because there's a consequence if you don't. <laughs> what was the consequence if you didn't give? You know, they were commanded to be taken tithes. You know, they had to give the tithes. It wasn't because they wanted to. They had to. They had to give the tithes. Otherwise, they were cursed with a curse. Yes? And that's just like what I do with my kids. You share that toy right now or I'm going to curse you with a little spoon on the bottom. <laughs> See, because that's the law. Everybody say law. Law can't stitch together new life on the inside of you. Law can only restrain the nature that's inside of you. It restrains the death, okay? So, like, I, I have to deal with some measure of law with my children to restrain them from, you know, being little heathens. Because <laughs> otherwise, they would just, they would take, they would kick, they would punch, they would lie. I have to give them law. They have to be taught the law. And this is what they were instructed to do in the Old Testament. Keep the law continually before your eyes. Meditate on it. Keep it. Put it in your heart. Put it in your mind. Okay, but as much as they did that, they couldn't stitch together a new life on the inside. That's what Jesus came to do, right? Because not only did the law come to restrain, the law also came to show the problem. The law came to expose. The law was there to say, look, you can't change yourself. And even though you keep the law as best you can, really what you need is something different completely on the inside of you. You need a miracle, right? You needed a miracle. Jesus was the miracle. Amen. And we are now, as the church, we are ministers of reconciliation to the rest of the world. We get to take this gospel of reconciliation to every single person. It's not, it's not so much about my religion versus your religion. It's uh, I've got the life of God and you don't. And it's not because I'm good. It's because he sent Jesus. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He wasn't boasting. He wasn't saying, look, you know, I'm kind of better than the rest of you. He was just plainly saying, look, was anybody else on this planet born of God? <laughs> was anybody else on this planet born without the will of man? See, because Jesus came not born of the will of the flesh, nor the will of the man, but the will of God. See, and he was the only one that had the life of God. He was, he was, let me put it, he was the only one born with life in a world of darkness. Go to John chapter 1. Everybody know this Pentecost? They celebrate Pentecost today? Pentecost Sunday. Maybe we'll get there. Go to John, the Gospel of John. Chapter 1. <clears throat> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All things were made by him. Made by who? The Word, right? This is the context we're talking about here. John does his own version of Genesis, all right? So John gives us the New Testament Genesis, but he says this is, we read in Genesis about the creation of the world, but we know that it was Jesus, the Word, made flesh. In the beginning was the Word, okay? That's how it's said. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him 
was not anything made that was made. Now, okay, I'll, I'll continue. We're going to back up in a minute. In him was life. Everybody say life. life. In him was life, and that life was the light of men, okay? Now, now look how he phrases this. This image is so powerful. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. I remember the kids, all of the, the, the children came up and did a skit for, for Children's Church Christmas. Maybe it was a couple Christmases ago. And, uh, and, and uh, when Jesus was born, Bethlehem, you know, the baby in the manger, there was like one light came, one light. But that one light, the moment you received Christ, that they had a candle, you know. And the moment that you received Christ, Christ came and lit your candle. And he took the light or the life that was on the inside of him and you had a candle. Let's just put it this way for the image sake. It wasn't lit. It was supposed to be lit. It was supposed to be on. It was supposed to be a, a light in the world, but it wasn't. And so Christ came when you received Christ. He took the life inside of him and he lit the candle inside of you. And, and so there was one light that came, but that light gets multiplied in every single person. And it is not now one light, but it is many, many lights. And this is why Jesus said, it's expedient that I go away because if I don't go away, the comforter won't come. Why was it expedient? Because not only did there need to be more than one light, there need to be more than one empowered witness with the Holy Spirit. See, and what Christ did on the earth was supposed to be a picture of what one light with the life of God on the inside of them, what that one light can do. He was here for three and a half years with the life of God and baptized with the Holy Spirit. Everybody with me? And that life of God, it says right here that, okay, in him was life and that life was the light of men and that light shined in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. We've been talking about chickens and ducks. It was a whole pen full of chickens but there was one duck put in there, just one. And they did not understand him. <laughs> did everybody, everybody see the image? The duck would go quack, 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 and the chickens would go, I don't know, whatever they do, <laughs> cock a doodle -doo. <laughs> They didn't understand. There was one, one different, what, there's one of these things, like Sesame Street, you know, one of these things is not like the other, <laughs> see? And Jesus was sent. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came to bear witness of the light that all men, sh might, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light. Now look at this verse here. That lighteth. Everybody say lighteth. That's, an act, that's a verb. That's an action that's happening there. He was the light, but that light lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. But the world didn't know him. The world knew him not. He came unto his own, which was the Jews. Even though the Jews were not like him yet, he had made a covenant with the Jews. They gave him his, or gave him his words, the law, basically gave them an outline of what God looked like. But there he was in the flesh, and he came unto his own, and his own didn't receive him either. But look at this, but as many as received him. Have you received Christ? Amen. If you've received Christ, to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are not born or which are, were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now see, I think it's in, oh, I might get it wrong, but there's, I believe it's in Hebrews, but I could be wrong. There's a place where it says we don't know any man after the flesh anymore. Not even Christ, we don't know him after the flesh. In other words, I, I know that you all have a physical lineage. You know, my, my physical father was Richard E. Edgar. I'm Richard D. Edgar. That was my physical father. But my spiritual father is God, see? And each and every one of you, you come with a spiritual lineage that contains baggage, that contains habits and behaviors, that contains genetics. All of those things are true. I, you know, it's not like we don't have genetic tendencies. One man may be more prone to alcoholic addiction than another. 
One man may be pr prone to a heart disease in another. There's, there's genetic tendencies. But I'm telling you right now that every single person that receives Christ, we don't know you after the flesh. We know you after the spirit. Because you have not been born of, the, see, no, no longer do we know you like this. Because it says here, but as many as received him, have you received him? Yes, we have. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, if you believed on his name, we don't know you like this. We don't, you weren't born of blood. You weren't born of the flesh. You're not born of the will of man. You're born of God. Everybody say this after me. I am born of God my Father. The light that was in Christ has lighted my life. And I am now a son and a daughter of God. That's a powerful picture right there. See, You're, that's a powerful picture. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld him. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. See, we've been talking about this flesh and the spirit and, and everybody has a flesh, but the flesh is more than just sin. The flesh is weakness. The flesh is inability. The flesh is futility. It's a lifetime of frustration. And see, most, most people, they build their lives on the efforts of their flesh. What can you do, you know? And, and, uh, and a lot of Christians, they live by that standard as well. They live by the standard of what can you do. And, and I'm not saying God won't bless them. I'm saying he, I believe he will. He will bless those. But do you know that God has, you know, he will, God will meet you wherever you are, right? He'll work with you wherever you are. Everybody with me? So if, if you give him a little bit, if you give him a cup of cold water <laughs> to work with, he'll work with that. You know, the truth that you know, he works with. The truth that you preach, he works with. See, I, I'm not against, and sometimes it sounds like I am, but I'm not. I am 100% an advocate and I am for every single denomination that's out there that's preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. I thank God for some of these, these, these organizations and these denominations that are getting people born again. Okay? If they're teaching the truth, they're, they're getting people free to some degree. See? And to the degree that they preach the truth, the truth is setting people free. Amen? Amen. But see, God will meet you wherever you are and whatever truth you understand and whatever walk of the Spirit that you have with Him. So if your flesh is, you know, you can try and serve Him in your own efforts for a season. Okay, but do you know that the Holy Spirit has come to be your helper? He's come to anoint you. He's come to be for you what you are not. And the whole purpose of this, Him, Jesus leaving and it's expedient that I go away. If I don't go away, the helper won't come. The Holy Spirit won't come. And the sad thing is, in most people's life, he's not really there. Because even though they've been born again, they go about trying to advance the kingdom of God in their own effort anyway. And they're not the spirit-empowered witnesses that God wanted to have on the earth. So you can, I applaud all of the effort that puts things out there and in their own flesh, they try and meet a need. That's not wrong, all right? But I'm also not for staying limited by what you can do because that's not why the Holy Ghost came. The Holy Ghost came so that he could co-labor, co-labor together with you. The Holy Ghost came so that you and him could do something that neither of you could do separately. Okay, see, as much important as the Holy Ghost is to you, you are important to him. You are. Because even though the Holy Spirit is all power, he cannot do works until you go do them. He cannot. He cannot. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> oh, Father. When Jesus was baptized at the very beginning, do you know that the Holy Spirit, when he was baptized, and, and, and it says the Holy Spirit descended on him, as a dove, everybody with me. How many, you know, Jesus was alive and walked around for 30 years. 
30 years in his hometown, 30 years going to Jerusalem and here and there and all over Israel. How many sick people do you think Jesus saw? How many, you know, how many beggars and cripples and, and bowed over and, 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 and funerals do you think he had to go to? I mean, you know what it's like out there. That's the way it was. It says the first miracle that he did is he turned water into wine. See, but it was after. Everybody say after. After the Holy Spirit came upon him, right? So there is a connecting that occurred that Jesus, as he came as a man, you know, he didn't come as some kind of hybrid God. That's what, re- that's what religion will teach you is we're not like Jesus because Jesus was God. Well, yes, he was God, but he didn't come as God. He didn't come as God. He came as a man anointed with the Holy Ghost. See, and he did no works. He did no miracles that we can see up until when the Holy Ghost came on him. And in one place, he was trying to talk to the Pharisees and the Pharisees were saying, well, you're casting out devils by other devils. It's the devil that's casting out these other devils. He says, if I cast out devils, the finger of God has come to you. Now, he was not the finger of God. It was the Holy Ghost that empowered him because no man has the ability to kind of go in there and get the spirits out of people. I can't reach in you and take cancer out, but the Holy Ghost can, see? It is that connection between there is a man present that believes the word and the truth and there is life in him and he is speaking my word and the Holy Ghost is performing what is being said. See, so there is this merger that takes place because without Jesus, the Holy Ghost cannot give any expression to the will of God. And without the Holy Ghost, Jesus does not have the power. Is everybody with me? It is a co-laboring process that when the Holy Ghost came upon Jesus, Jesus went about doing good and healing all those that are oppressed of the devil because he was God, because God was with him. It doesn't say because he was God. It says because God was with him. Who was with him? It was the Holy Ghost that fell on him. And see, those 30 years he grew up and he must have seen funerals and he must have seen sick people and he must have seen, he must have watched people die in front of him and just growing in the knowledge of God until that one day where the Holy Spirit comes and and they make a connection and they are, he is baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. And then from that point on, you see miracles taking place. Everybody with me? Amen. Go to Genesis. Chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to do a little comparing and contrasting of these. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, I don't want to dwell on this, but there's a lot of really powerful pictures there. You know, because it says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. You know, he's not just talking about this tiny little planet here. (laughs) He's not just talking about earth, earth. I I, I believe he's talking about everything that has been created. Because, hey, you know, time is is a created thing. Do you know if you... If you take away the substance and you take away space and you take away the matter, there is no time. All of those things are connected. There is a time and a place and a destination and all of those things are created things and God exists outside of those created things. God is not subject to the things he has made. If God were subject to time, how, why would God be subject to something he has created? Let's see, So all, he's... Basically, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Everything that you see, as as far as you can peer that telescope out there, it wasn't there. (laughs) I used to think that 
heaven was a planet far, far away, <laughs> you know. I used to think, you know, maybe if you steered your telescope in the right direction, we could find planet heaven, you know. But I don't believe it's like that at all. I believe it's, it's, it's not even visible. It's, it's spiritual. Same. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So I want you to get the picture of absolute nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Empty, void, dark. This is the picture. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. But look at this. And the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So here's, the, everybody say the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. See, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of of the waters. Now, you know, this, this is in here for a reason because it, it not only is telling us something about God, it's also telling us something about how we relate to God, okay? So this is not just for him describing himself. It's not just his autobiography. He's also letting you know this is how God works. This is how it works. This is how it was set up from the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, okay? How did he do that? It was, form, it was without form, it was formless, it was void, it was dark. But the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, a lot of times we just get this idea of God, well, he can do whatever he wants, or we think he's some kind of... Anybody ever seen those superheroes in the movies now? They can control matter, you know, they can just reassimilate it in their heads and just will things into existence, you know, those X-Men and superheroes that can just... Oh, if I wanted to make a gun, I would just assemble it right now in my mind, you know. Well, we get the idea that God can just presto, change, or do whatever he wants, make matter out of nothing. Look at how God creates. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, everybody say said, let there be light, and there was light. In the Hebrew, it, it's, it's, it's more direct. It says, light be. It just says, light be. Light was. See. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And, the God, and God saw the light, and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, everybody say said. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now, we could go on and on, but you get to picture verse 9, and God said, okay, look here in verse 14, and God said, uh, he, you know, it's just God said, God said, God said, all right? Go back to John 1. <clears throat> look at look at how John John not only calls Jesus God, he calls him a specific name. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. So there was a member of the Godhead that was the Spirit of God that was hovering over the waters, but there was also a member of the Godhead that was saying, giving the command. Everybody with me? See, so we see this, this cooperation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John is essentially saying, look, the Spirit of God was there hovering over the waters, but it was the pre-incarnate Christ, the Word of God, that was doing all of this speaking. It was Jesus who was standing back there and he says, let there be light. That's what Jesus was doing. This was the member of the Godhead that was doing this. Let there be, let there be, let there be. And he goes on and he says, this, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. By what, by what operation was everything made by God? He was speaking it out and the Holy Ghost was performing it. Everybody see that? So when he said, let there be light, it was... The Holy Ghost went and did it, see? 
and, and all of this substance, everything that you can put your hands on, you can see, and the, the earth and the dirt and the elements and all the periodic table and everything that exists, and even into the micro world of all the tiny little particles that make up the atoms that they're still finding things out about, everything that is here was created by the Holy Spirit. But it wasn't just, it was said, and then it was. Everybody see that? Okay. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and that light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. See, in verse 12, I'm just reiterating this for thoroughness, but but as many as received him, have you received him? Yes, we have. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And you were not born of blood or the will of flesh or the will of man. That's not the kind of birth we're talking about here, but the will of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. See, he's talking about Jesus, the very word of God. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's see. Let's be turning to Matthew. Go to uh, chapter 28. <laughs> we know the scripture it says Jesus, he says we know Jesus of Nazareth, how he went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. And he set into motion because he is the captain of our salvation. He is the author of our faith. He is our picture and our mark. He came as a man to represent what man was supposed to be on this earth. And even in the Old Testament, without the life of God, there was nothing done apart from cooperation with man and God. See, And even Moses and Noah and, and, uh, and Samuel and David and Solomon, all of these things, there was a cooperation that came. And even though they didn't have the image of God on the inside of them, they believed the word of God and they had faith in the word of God enough for God to get the will done on this earth to some degree. Everybody see that? See, so when the word came to Noah, build an ark because it's going to rain and it's going to flood and it's going to cover the, the, the whole planet. See, Noah had to believe that word and not only believe it and say, I agree with it, but he also spent the rest of his life building that thing. I mean, can you imagine, here? I heard God, something that's never happened before is going to happen. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to spend the rest of my life getting ready for it. That's tremendous faith. Who, who else has heard this? I don't think anybody else has heard this. You want to talk about faith in God's word. Let's see, God got will done through that. All right. <clears throat> verse, uh, verse 18. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now look here in this verse 18 where he says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Let me ask you something. Has God's power in heaven or in the spiritual ever been challenged? <laughs> now, I mean, I mean in the sense that, yes, the, that Satan did try and overthrow or he tried to pretend to be God for a season and God gave them a season in that time, okay? But God is God in heaven, right? He is God in heaven, There was no authority problem in heaven. Everybody with me? Where was the authority problem? It was here on this planet. And Jesus is saying, all power is given unto me in heaven. Well, that was not lost. But it's 
and in earth. Everybody with me? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore in all nations. Now, in the Jewish mindset, when they first started to, or when they understood that there was supposed to be a Christ or a Messiah coming, one of the things that they had in their mind that what was going to come, it was going to be a natural kingdom. It was going to be a natural revolution. It was going to be a natural, uh, you know, like they were going to have their own nation and they were going to, the Messiah was going to lead them into freedom. And they were, the extent of God's plan in their heads was that they were going to set up their own place and it was going to be a revolution for them. You know, similar to maybe what happened in America. We overthrew Great Britain, you know. And they had this idea of a, of a godly country, but it was overthrowing and it was setting up a natural reign and a natural rule. And Jesus went about when he was preaching. What did he always preach? He was saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, and see, what were the Jews looking for? They were looking for the kingdom. They were looking for a kingdom, but their idea was a flesh kingdom, a natural kingdom, something they could do. And see, but Jesus didn't preach that kind of kingdom. He says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And see, this kingdom of heaven that's at hand, <clears throat> see, in a natural kingdom, when a king has a decree or a king is trying to... Hmm, uh, well, if a king is trying to wage war and overcome a country or take over a territory, what does he do? He sends out his armies, does he not? He sends out his messengers. He sends out his people to, to come take that place. See, And Jesus went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of who? It was the devil. And in the scriptures, it's the, it says that Satan was the god of this world. Was he not? So when we lost that life and our candle went out, it was the enemies that essentially had the keys to this kingdom here. He didn't have any authority in heaven, but he had some authority here in that man gave authority up and they had the death nature. He was, they were made in the likeness of him now. See, and sin reigned unto death. See, but Jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And so when Jesus preached, he wasn't preaching a gospel or a... Uh, he wasn't preaching a message of overthrowing Rome or come, coming up with their own natural keep, kingdom. He was saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so what did he go about doing? He, he didn't fight natural soldiers. He, he was fighting spiritual soldiers. He was coming against the enemy in every single corner of that place. And he was rebuking him and setting him free and casting out devils and the oppressed widows. He'd loose them. And, and uh, this is the work of war. He was waging warfare, not on a people, but on a spiritual place. He was loosing, he was loosing them. He was setting them free. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Let's go to, um, let's see here. Matthew, I believe it's 16. Yes, Matthew chapter 16. Praise your Father. <laughs> Matthew 16. We'll start here in verse 15. And Jesus said, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, what, what is this? See, there is a battle going on on this planet, and it's still going on to some degree. But Jesus has been given all power in heaven and in earth. See, and there is a, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What is the rock? The rock here is not Peter. It is not the fleshly lineage of Peter. The rock here is the revelation that he is Christ. The rock here is the foundation so that this is Christ, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church. The church is built upon the rock of Jesus Christ. That's, that you can find that all over the New Testament, that he is the chief cornerstone, see? 
and I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now when you read that in the King James, you almost get the sense that the church is sitting still and that hell is coming over and trying to take it over. What it's saying there is the gates of hell aren't going to prevail against it. It's the gates of hell. They are the ones that are shut up trembling in fear at the power that Jesus has been loosed on this earth and he has given you life and now you are loosed on this earth. And see, what the gates of hell are shut up against is they don't want you taking any of their land. They're completely at your mercy. Before Jesus, they were not at your mercy. They had the hold of you. But devil doesn't have the hold of you anymore because you have been loosed and who the sun sets free is free indeed. And you've not only been set free on the inside, but you have been anointed with the Holy Ghost to declare war over all of the captives of the enemy. And it is now our job to loose them and set them free. Amen. See, <clears throat> thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In other words, they've got their gates up. They got their walls up. They're trying to hold their ground. But the, the power of God is going to tear down every wall. It's going to take apart everything that the devil has put up and it's going to take it over. See, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the keys are meant for, what is a key? It, if I have the key to this place, I have the authority to get in there. See, not everybody gets to have a key to your car. Not everybody gets to have a key to your house. The key is the authority, right? It's the authority to have dominion in a place. Now, now he has, he's the only one that has this authority. But he says, I give unto thee. Do you see what he's saying here? I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Look at the order of progression. How is this happening? See, this is the way we top, typically think and talk about of God. Well, if God wills it, it'll happen here. See, if God wants to do something, he from heaven, he will say it, and then it'll just happen here. Jesus says it this way, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. We must not have had them before. And whatsoever you bind on earth, then it's going to be bound in heaven. In other words, if you here on earth take authority and bind the thing, heaven gets behind you and binds it in heaven. See, so when Jesus came and he would say, if he bound a devil or if he rebuked it and sent it out of a person, he would say it and the Holy Ghost would do it. Everybody with me? See, so it is a, if you bind on earth, then it's bound in heaven. If you loose on earth, it'll be loosed in heaven. Let's look at some binding and some loosing. <laughs> Go to... <clears throat> Let's go to Luke chapter 7. This is the centurion. And there's too many to go over, so I'm just going to give an example so you can see this in action. <clears throat> and Jesus was coming to heal this, this uh, centurion servant. And this is this, what the centurion said. He says, I don't want you to come into my house. I didn't think it was necessary that I come unto you in person. Now look here in verse 7. Luke 7, verse 7. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, and having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, go. Well, then he goes. That's what authority is, right? And, and to another come, and he comes. And to my service, do this, and he does it. And Jesus heard these things, and he marveled at him. And he turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I have say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent returning to his house found the servant whole that had been sick. So what do we get from this verse is that this, this person understood authority that when he said something, it had to happen. 
It had to happen. Because what, what would happen if you rebelled against the authority of your centurion? <laughs> the law is going to come down on you. And if necessary, well, let's say you can, you can resist the law. Well, then all of Rome will come down on you. <laughs> the whole authority of Rome is behind that. And this guy was saying, I recognize that you are someone under authority. And that what you're saying is being backed up and it's not being backed up by you. There's somebody else with you that we don't have. It is God that is with you, see? And whatever you say, I know you don't, have, you don't even have to come to my house. If God's with you, you can just say it and it'll happen, see? And Jesus marveled at this guy, see? Because religion, it keeps trying to put God in a box, but God, the way he operates, he operates by the spoken word. And when you start to get in line with what you say, about what God thinks and his will, and those things come together, the Holy Spirit will start to back up what you're saying. And whatever we bound in, whatever is bound in earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever is loosed in earth will be loosed in heaven. So here's Jesus, there's this sick person. I loose that person, heaven gets behind it, they're loosed, okay? What about that woman that was in the, um, uh, she was in the synagogue and she was bound over those 18 years and, he's, and he was saying, what, what do you think? Is it legal to heal on the Sabbath day? He says, woman, be thou loosed of her infirmity. What, he said it, but did he do anything? Do you think he went over there and tried to? <laughs> he didn't. The Holy Ghost went. And, and when it was said, the Holy Ghost did it. And we say, well, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. He's different. As he was sent, he has sent you. As you were as he was a son and a uh, son, you were made son and daughters. The glory that he had is the glory that you have. Amen. Now look at this. Go to Acts chapter 3. The man at the gate, beautiful. Acts chapter 3, verse 2. A certain man, lame from his mother's womb. In other words, his entire life he'd been like this. Lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John and said, Look on us. And he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I have. Everybody say, I have. I have. Did, wasn't it Jesus that turned around and said, the keys of the kingdom I'm giving you, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, you'll be loosed in heaven. See? He had this. Everybody say, I have this. I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, what precedes the rising and the walking? The speaking Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered into the temple. Walking and leaping and praising God. So now you don't just have Jesus on the offensive and the gates of hell are boarded up and they're so afraid of what the, everywhere Jesus went they're just ripping the devil apart. Now he's got all of these 120 that he's got to contend with and he's got to try and contain and now he's got the rest of them and now there's 5,000 and now there's all the millions that are out there and the only thing that keeps people in the box that this is their kingdom that they're on the offensive trying to enforce the dominion that they have been given in Jesus Christ is beliefs that are not from him. It is the beliefs that I am not worthy. It is the beliefs that I don't have any power. It's the beliefs that the Holy Ghost is not for today. It is all those beliefs that from that moment when the Holy Ghost came upon Jesus, he went about doing good. And the moment he says, you wait until the Holy Ghost comes because he's going to be, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses to Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Do you think it was just the 12 that were supposed to go to every single corner of the earth? <laughs> Come on. That's who we are. That's what we're supposed to do. This Pentecost, this is supposed to be Pentecost. It's not just supposed to be, yay, it happened. It's supposed to be still happening. It never should have left. And, uh, 
And I don't care what I haven't seen. I'm, we're going to see it again. Amen. We're going to see it again. We'll go to another one. Go to Acts chapter 14. Paul, who never knew Jesus in the flesh, right? Apostle out of due season. <clears throat> Look at this. Acts chapter 14, verse 8. There was, the, and there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and he walked. Do you notice that the proclamation precedes? It, the speaking precedes what is said. And then it is supposed to be followed up with the Holy Ghost work see it is that same picture from the very beginning that when the word spoke the holy ghost moved and in john it says and the word was flesh see and whatever he the worlds were made by him and the world didn't know him but to them he gave power to become the sons of god See, and now we have been sent and we are created in his image this work this the devil is trembling in fear every single day since the time that Jesus rose from the grave. Every single day he is, he is completely powerless because at your will, not at his will and unfortunately not at God's will, at your will, whatever you bind is bound. Whatever is loosed is loosed. He gave us the keys to the kingdom. If I have a key to my car, I can go in there at will and I can get in and I can get out. And if I've been given the keys to bind and to loose, I have the authority to bind and to loose. See? And we pray these prayers with faithless words that try and say, well, if, if God wills, we're past that already. We're past that already. He willed when he sent Jesus. Well, if he wills to heal... How about you study the stripes on Jesus' back and you ask me if he's still willing? See, this, see the gospel, it's not an on again, off again. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. It is a kingdom. It is a power. And you are the representatives of it. You are supposed to be in the, he said, it's expedient that I go away. Why? Oh, Jesus, just stay here and keep, unraveling the devil's kingdom if i don't go then then I, you know if i stay here the holy ghost won't come because now the devil only has to deal with me but he can't deal with 120 of you he can't deal with 5000 of you he can't deal with a million of you that's you amen that's the power of pentecost let's just read it before we go this is becoming more real to me. <clears throat> Go to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, <clears throat> They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. Now when there was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because 
that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? In verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be it known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in these last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Everybody say all flesh. Does that include you? It most certainly does. <clears throat> all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So, Jesus had to go because each and every one of you are now to continue the work that he sent you on. You have been given the keys of the kingdom. All authority in heaven and on earth is his. And you are the body of Christ. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And just as that centurion, he had no doubts, absolutely no doubts, that if he called for Rome, he could get the reinforcements he needed. That if his word was law, if, if our word and law is, is regarded, how much more should we regard the spiritual and, and, and words of Jesus Christ who said you have been given the keys of the kingdom. All authority is in heaven. All authority in heaven and earth is mine. He says you shall receive the power. The power of a kingdom. The power to enforce. We're going to take the devil's land back. And all of that kingdom that he has bottled up in the people that are crippled and diseased and that they're, they're in slavery to fear and to sin that are in this city, they don't get to keep them. The devil doesn't get to keep them. We get to take them. Because it's not just about what you can do. It's about what the Holy Ghost and you can do together. That's what Pentecost is about. Amen. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray this would be more than a message more than just understanding. I don't want to understand these things. I want to do these things. I don't want to know how to fly a plane. I want to fly the plane. Father, I thank you for giving us a reality in our hearts. Give us a reality. Give us a reality in our hearts of the truth of your word. That as we go about our day, that as we go about our week, we don't go about it in our strength. We go about it with the Holy Ghost who was sent to enforce the kingdom of God. Everywhere we go, we get to be the light. Everywhere we go, we get to loose those that are captive. We get to set them free. As you know, Jesus, who went about doing good and healing all those that are pressed to the devil, for God was with him, and now God is with us. And he wants to accomplish what we cannot. So I thank you for strength to obey and for the reality of the kingdom to set in our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name. Everybody say amen.